So I'd like to begin with the topic of public-private partnerships. So this isn't going to be purely private capital, I don't think, because the projects are big and expensive and take a long time, as we've heard. Uh, on the other hand, the public sector maybe isn't prepared to sponsor these things alone. So maybe, Scott, I'd invite you to begin, and then other panelists. Could you maybe speak to what does that model look like, and what might that model look like in the Arctic? Sure. Um, I found Tony's comments very interesting. And with some of the discussions that I've had an opportunity with some people here, one of the things that I've begun to realize is that the Arctic needs a master plan. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> we talk about one-off developments and so on and so forth, mm -hmm. but there needs to be an overarching vision for what uh, infrastructure looks like in the Arctic. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that, let me just say, that's a very broad topic, mm -hmm. whether it's ports or uh, a ground transportation or search and rescue equipment or mm -hmm. communications, whatever falls into that bucket. And Tony, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly that uh, this is a dialogue which must start soon and it must involve all parties, both from the public side and from the, part, the private side. Um, you're right, Tony, in that uh, investment capital is an impatient group. Uh, uh, they like to see uh, returns quickly. Uh, and I think uh, <clears throat> what we need to do, uh, in addition to developing this this overarching master plan for the Arctic, and I'm and I'm not talking about, you know, a group of uh, you know nine men getting in a room and strategizing. I'm talking about developing a format or a forum to open up a dialogue, mm -hmm. so that we can get a sense of what uh, all of the uh, uh, the needs of the Arctic are, and we can start to sketch out what this looks like and what it's mm -hmm. going to cost. But additionally, <clears throat> I think we need to start developing the institutions and a framework uh, to bring capital to play. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, <clears throat> we have had some preliminary discussions about an idea uh, of a development bank. Uh, development banks like uh, the European Investment Bank or the EBRD uh, are institutions uh, which are not so concerned about instant return uh, but are there to help uh, stimulate private investment by reducing risk and taking some of, of that uh, uh, variability and, and longer risk out of the equation, uh, which private sector money does not want. Uh, so I think that uh, working in the coming years uh, on a sort of a master plan or a roadmap for the Arctic by the Arctic peoples, uh, in addition to uh, working to develop the institutions which will be necessary to finance this, both public and private or together, uh, is, the, is probably the leading challenge that people like me have today. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Mead, if I could turn to you next. Does Alaska have a master plan, and what does the state do to help attract private capital to deal with some of these risk issues? Well, I'm not sure I would say we have a master plan, but I will say that we've got lots of experience with public-private partnerships within our state. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we have a natural gas pipeline venture moving forward now, which is a public-private partnership, and the state owns one-eighth of the gas, so that's merged in. So the state will be a partner mm -hmm. in the development of that gas. We've been very active in the development of the oil, Mm -hmm. using our royalty share to develop uh, refineries and so forth. Where I would suggest, uh, in terms of Scott's master plan idea, is that there's, uh, you know, we certainly have investable vessels that will be public-private vessels in terms of ports, in terms of icebreakers. Uh, we are doing it now in terms of telecommunications. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have close to $100 billion or more worth of projects mm -hmm. that are looking for, for capital uh, that will have the public-private model with it. Mm -hmm. But I think for us in the Arctic, in terms of the master plan, there's, there's at least two industries, maybe three if you include uh, certain, some mining ideas, mm -hmm. where the uh, more than one nation will be needed to come to the table to make the infrastructure work. Mm -hmm. And let me just say on shipping, for example, uh, there, there are several different scenarios for shipping that have been running around this room and in conversations. Uh, there's the Russian Northern Sea Route model, where mm -hmm. the Russians have icebreaker escorts. Mm -hmm. You show up, you tell them what time you're coming, you pay your bill, and they take you, uh, they take you across the top of the continent. 
Uh, there may be the unescorted vessel model, which, which uh, uh, d uh, the shipbuilders believe we can get to now where it's just like any other ocean. Mm -hmm. uh, or it may be something where we and Iceland look at a hub, and, uh, a hub model. Mm -hmm. uh, where it's a shuttle across with heavy machinery and then connect in with regular, with regular container shipping other places. Mm -hmm. It's hard to say exactly what scenario is going to work, but mm -hmm. I do think we need to look at mm -hmm. what is the common investment going to be there. Mm -hmm. Likewise, uh, we heard from space promoters yesterday, and there's a number of things in the satellite telecommunications business where, frankly, I think Arctic cooperation has failed. Mm -hmm. in getting us the best deal for telecommunications, mm -hmm. and we could get it. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to mining, there's certainly an advantage in looking at common smelters and, and uh, you know, how to, how to combine mining with the least expensive energy. Yeah. So at least in those three areas, mm -hmm. I would say a master plan would work because it would force capital and finance ministers and governors to yeah. get, and, and presidents to get together to make the basic projects in the Arctic happen. Is that the World Bank or the Arctic Council or where, what, who helps that? Well, I, I look at the nations, the eight nations of the Arctic and, you know, uh, Norway, Alaska have large sovereign wealth funds. Yeah. Uh, uh, Iceland has certainly demonstrated uh, lots of versatility in, and capability in the finance sector. Yeah. Uh, I, I believe that uh, a new institution may bring together several of the local institutions around the north yeah. uh, for cooperation. It may, one project will probably help define it. Yeah. Bjarni, I want to come to you in a second to talk about Iceland's view of attracting foreign capital. But first, Mead said something very interesting about differing shipping models. And from the Daiwu perspective, do you have a, a preferred model for shipping in the Arctic? What do you think is going to be the winner? So in my material, I got uh, from uh, many solutions. Because uh, Anthony and Mead mentioned about the uh, cost matter yeah. and how to go to in tomorrow, not yeah. today. Yeah. But still, we are building Arc 7 LNG carrier. Maybe it will deliver uh, 16 uh, March in the Arctic. It means any type of ship we can go without any icebreak resistance. You know, the new Panama Canal, as beam is 49 meter, and the biggest icebreaker is 34 meter, but our island carrier 50 meter without yeah. icebreak resistance. Yeah. In terms of the going northern sea route in the winter season, yeah. or season, we need two icebreakers for bigger ship. Okay. But either Suez Max, Apra Max, or New Paramax container ship, we can go. So, so it's a vessel. combination of models depending on the ship, the cargo, and the route. Of course, yes. Yeah. So still we are building a design for the tanker or yeah. over carrier. A land carrier, any type of ship you can go by tomorrow. Tony, you wanted to add something to that? Yeah, I'm, the, the idea of private-public pu partnerships is a terrific idea. I want to bring in another dimension, though. And again, what we've seen in the mining industry across the world is that the strongest initiatives of this sort, in fact, bring together government and business and civil society. And civil society gets forgotten. And I, I think of the northern shipping issues again, um, and I think simultaneously of the environmental organizations in the world that are focused in, on marine environment. The conversation between those groups and the business groups and the governments involved in Arctic shipping should start yesterday. Um, and they're, they're not the enemy. That is a big lesson in the, in the mining industry that civil societies people are a key part of the conversation. So mm -hmm. there's a different aspect of mm -hmm. partnership here that has to include civil society. Yeah. I really believe that. Yeah. So Bjarni, uh, Iceland is in a really exciting strategic spot, as you mentioned, for attracting investment in new businesses. And yet it's also in a very interesting moment in its history after the financial crisis and issues with the currency, et cetera. How does Iceland think about attracting private capital where it is in its moment, both, I guess, in the, in the near to medium term, but also the long term? Well, as you mentioned, I, I believe we are strategically extremely well placed in the North Atlantic. Uh, we have uh, open harbors uh, year round, and uh, there can be no doubt when you look at the shipping routes that uh, we are in the midst of the area which is uh, of importance. Um, but as you can also hear from the panel here, we are, I feel, at the beginning of a very important discussion. 
uh, there is talk of uh, new institutions to mm -hmm. come to the next step. Mm -hmm. There is talk of uh, even uh, the need for uh, development bank, as I heard mentioned, uh, and, and which is an idea which I, I believe makes a lot of sense. Um, and uh, the points that have been made on the dialogue with civil society, I think, are also of very much importance. And those things are all happening already, for example, in Iceland. We have seen interests from abroad on, for example, building harbors in Iceland in rural areas where the people will uh, experience tremendous change. And if the idea is unsuccessful, it's going to be a disaster. And at this point in time, you feel like well, I mentioned the race earlier in my talk. Sometimes I feel like underneath the water there is a quiet race happening already. Mm -hmm. People are trying to find out, okay, will the port be in the east of Iceland, north of uh, Norway or possibly in Canada? And who's going to take the first step? And how are we going to include, <coughs> let's say, civil society or even create a public-private partnership when we really don't feel from the gut yeah. that we have the answer. Yeah. Are we going to risk uh, taxpayers' money on it? Right. Are we going to risk uh, environmental factors? Are we going to risk um, social issues, such as the ones that have been mentioned? I think those are all tremendously important questions. Yeah. At the time, to maybe more directly answer your question, at the time we see we are strategically very well located, we certainly have the interest to make the best of the opportunities at hand. Yeah. We want to see a structured uh, plan being made, and we, we like to work within the frameworks of the uh, Arctic Council. Yeah. Like I said, I believe uh, we must move forward based on a solid structure of uh, law and uh, respect of, for the rule of law. But uh, we are starting to threat waters which, uh, where we will not have all the answers. Yeah. So a lot of your comments have to do with timing. And I know, for example, we, we talk here about climate change and coming business. There's already a lot of business. The largest zinc and nickel mines are in the Arctic. Uh, huge productive fisheries are in the Arctic. There's uh, extraordinary oil and gas product production already there. Yet a lot of these comments are about I think anticipated business with climate change that's coming. So I'd love to hear the panelists sort of view on the timing of these opportunities. Is this something that's ripening, that's ripe? Will it be next year at the Arctic Circle that we talk about sort of the investment bank has been formed and sort of there's billions of dollars being pushed out the door to finance some sort of major hub and spoke shipping system? Um, anybody have a view on the timing of when, when, this, when the Arctic opportunity ripens? Or is it, is it now, Mead? You just heard Costco talk about bringing a cargo ship across the Arctic Ocean, unescorted, carrying containers, going from China to Iceland. Yeah. And let's just take that scenario. Um, Asian goods going to Europe come to a hub here where they go to different points in Europe. Okay, That would mean building a larger port here or a container port here. Mm -hmm. uh, for our end of the world... You might not need to stop in Alaska on your way, but on the other hand, filling up that ship on the way back, uh, stop in Alaska at a place like Adak or on Alaska, uh, and ship some containers may go on to Asia, some containers may go on to different points in Asia with different ships going by in the North uh, Pacific route, mm -hmm. and some may go to North America. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in that case, you would need twin ports. You would need development uh, in in this part of the world, on this side of the Arctic, as well as on our side of the Arctic. Mm -hmm. So whether we do it as a development bank or perhaps something like uh, an Arctic Sea Route Authority, uh, as, as they do in the St. Lawrence, uh, with the St. Lawrence Sea Route Agreements, uh, or uh, something when you talk about port authorities, you can look at several major metropolitan areas around the world that have be, where the port authorities have become major financing vehicles. Mm -hmm. And so if we had one group that was looking at shipping and affiliated infrastructure where yeah. our nation said we're going to go to the world together, promote safe shipping in the world together, and offer reliability, uh, which is what the, sh what the shipping interests tell us is, is, is most important. 
they want to tell the people whose goods they're carrying that they're, they're going to get there on time. And so it's going to take infrastructure on our part on both sides of the Arctic yep. uh, in order to make it work. So whether it's a development bank, Scott, or the, or the idea of a, of a shipping authority, I think it is ripe to begin those, having those kind of feasibility discussions. Yeah, so the timing for those institutions are today to build the infrastructure for the Arctic of tomorrow. Is that right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I agree. I think one thing I would say uh, to Governor Treadwell is I don't think a development bank or a shipping authority or a maritime authority, any of these ideas are mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. The amount of capital that's going to have to go into the Arctic is humongous. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> the, the, to my chart that I, I spoke to uh, about the melting sea ice, the reality is if, if we decided we were going to just today, while we're here today, we're going to have the complete master plan for the Arctic and we're going to begin now. Mm -hmm. The reality is those deliverables are going to start showing up a decade or two from now. Mm -hmm. So if we really, you know, we hear Costco shipping through the, through the Arctic, we hear all these needs that are out there that are, are, are coming, yeah. uh, to quote Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, tomorrow is now. Yeah. So uh, if we're going to do this, we are going to have to begin now yeah. to, to get these institutions in place to make it happen. Okay, uh, great. I'd like to maybe pivot just a, a bit and, of course, tackle the elephant room in a sense, which is the business opportunities exist in the Arctic because of climate change, right? And many of the members of the audience represent environmental groups, uh, NGOs, uh, all of us actually, of course, love the environment and it's near dear to our hearts. And there's now opening access to regions uh, that used to be sort of frozen or, or less accessible. The Arctic wasn't always thought of as a emerging economy or frontier market. How, how should private capital or businessmen or investors or us in the room think about that paradox? What, what is a, and I guess uh, prefacing this last bit of the question, it's also an extraordinary opportunity because now we have, we have a chance to get it right, to, to have s truly sustainable development, a new model of investing that we're talking about here. What, what are the views of the panelists about sort of that paradox about climate change allowing more access and the investment that comes with it? Did you want to, uh, you have the microphone, Mr. Klein. Uh, I want to show you my uh, presentation material then easily understand how to go easily access. He's got a short video. Mm, short. Oh, you have a short video? Okay. Not short, sure, but yeah. um, can we see it? Please ask them. I don't control the video. No. Not not video, but uh, if um, anyone's listening in the control room in the back. Some, some slide. Yeah. Yeah. I already gave you my uh, PowerPoint. Uh huh. Looks like there's a mouse moving. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's progress. <coughs> Yeah, while they're pulling that up, Tony, could you maybe speak to that? And I'll, I'll leap, uh, and if, if they get going on this. Listen, change has happened for a long, long time. I don't think it's useful, personally, I don't, I don't this so-called paradox, it's a reason in this meeting, it wasn't, that wasn't part of the jargon last year. Um, is, what are we really saying? Do we want to encourage climate change in order to encourage business? Is that the real underlying message? I mean, it's not, of course. And so what we have to do, I think for those who wish to um, argue about whether or not there's a paradox, we should set up a room next year and put them all in that room and they can argue about that. Because what I'm really interested in doing, and quite frankly, I think people in the mining industry are interested in doing, is responding to the change that we see in a way that cares for the people in the north and cares for the environment of the north. And we need to get on with that in a practical way. Yeah. That's my sense about it. That would be an exciting room next year. Yeah. To have Maybe there'd be a yeah. lot of people in it too, I don't know, but I won't be there. Yeah.